recently uh, that says that you are to be the new chair of the SETI Institute. So can you tell me what this job will entail? Well, first of all, this is the um, chair of, an, of a uh, Marilyn and Watson Alberts um, contribution to SETI. It's not really the SETI Institute. Um, they've generously donated money to Berkeley uh, to pursue the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And so my thanks go out to um, Marilyn and Watson Alberts for their contribution to fund SETI work. Um, and I'm really, you know, honored and sort of uh, amazed that, that they've uh, pointed, uh, you know, appointed me to this chair position because, you know, I, I feel like I'm just struggling along here trying to do research and teach here at UC Berkeley. And it's really inspirational to me, actually, to, um, you know, to, to be nudged and encouraged to, to try to pursue the search for intelligent life in the universe. So are you saying that there's something even, I mean, what you've done so far, what the uh, Slate article says is that you are the Usain Bolt of uh, extrasolar planets. Um, you found 70 out of the first 100. So is searching for intelligent life somehow a, a step beyond that or a sort of building upon that previous work? Well, honestly, you know, I was searching for planets around other stars b before anybody else was, or along with Michel Mayor in Geneva, Switzerland. And we both started off in the 1980s when no one thought it was possible to find planets we've been lucky enough to succeed. Uh, and now there are hundreds, you might even say thousands of people in the world trying to find new techniques to discover planets around other stars, new techniques for the analysis of them, analyzing their spectra, the atmospheres, the interiors, there's theorists modeling the planets. The whole field has exploded when there were literally just two of us uh, not that long ago, it seems. We were wondering if we would find any planets at all, and now we have thousands. So it seems to me that the, the question that I have to answer is, how can I best serve science and best play a role in the future? And one thing that I have the luxury of being able to do is uh, pursue some research that maybe not everybody else is doing because it's far-fetched, the probability of success is low, the techniques aren't well spelled out. So I think the search for life elsewhere in the universe is a next logical step in science, and it's also the next logical step for me, because the exoplanet field is now so enriched with smart people like you, uh, who are doing Thank it. You. Who needs me when we have smarter people? Well, you know, well, not just me, but all of our undergraduate listeners who are trying to figure out when, you know, as they begin their research careers, what should I do to further science? What is my place and where can I make the best contribution, but also perhaps where is sort of a safe place for me to do research right. and develop research skills um, as in sort of my fledgling state before I, you know, take off with tenure uh, right. or whatever. Um, so I guess you, when you first started looking for exoplanets, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't an assured slam dunk. There might not have been any. We thought we wouldn't find any, and when I would ask fellow scientists um, what they thought of my uh, interest and efforts to discover planets around other stars, they would look down at their shoes and, and scuffle their feet and, and change the subject. Um, it was embarrassing to, to look for planets in the 1970s and 80s and, and even through most of the 90s because everybody knew you would never find planets around other stars. They don't shine uh, by any energy generation that takes place in their interiors. Their brightness is dwarfed by the host star by a factor of a billion or more. Um, there just wasn't any logical or assured way of detecting planets. So, you know, it was a long shot and I, I think searching for life elsewhere in the universe is frankly even a longer long shot. 
um, because we already have had great efforts made to detect intelligent life, technological life, using radio telescopes, optical telescopes, now infrared telescopes, and frankly, they've all failed. So, you know, when you enter into a field in which there are precisely zero detections, you know, what makes you think you're going to do better? And the answer is, if you don't try, you certainly won't succeed. And so I have the luxury to, to give it a shot and to engage other smart people who have better technical ideas, even theoretical ideas, about how to hunt for intelligent life in the universe. Right. So you, you said both in the Slate article and just now that you have this luxury of being able to take a long shot. So for our undergraduate audience, can you define sort of when, when they have that luxury? I mean, obviously, it's a very personal decision, yeah. but as advice to them to, to sort of maybe balance personal goals and career goals, when would you say the tipping point for having that luxury is? Here's the way I would put this. If you're an undergraduate science student or even a non-scientist and you're looking for research projects to do, you always have to weigh two uh, opposite ideas. On the one hand, there are research projects that you can do which will, when you're successful, incrementally uh, advance our knowledge in some field, whether it's biology or chemistry or geology or astronomy, it doesn't matter, mathematics. You, you can find research projects which, when successful, will increase humanity's knowledge of that one subject a little bit. And that's great. That's what, you know, beginning projects should be about. On the other hand, there are projects which, if you do them, you will utterly change the paradigm. You'll change people's thinking. You'll overturn relativity or overturn quantum mechanics, find a way to travel faster than the speed of light. And, of course, the, the balance there is that the incremental science uh, is science that you have a very good chance of succeeding at, but the gains are relatively modest. On the other hand, if you try to do a research project that overturns you know, a major paradigm, your chances of success are quite small, probably. But if you're successful, the impact is enormous. Obviously, there's a spectrum in between. And you have to choose whether you're an undergraduate or, frankly, a faculty member. You have to make some decision about where in that spectrum the, the, un, you know, the, the secure uh, incremental work or the very low probability but high impact work. And you're always um, balancing those two. The best way to do research as you get older is to choose a few research projects, some of them long shots, some of them are bread and butter sure things, and so you have a smattering of each. That sounds like good advice. Uh, is there anything else you would like to tell our undergraduate, and I should say graduate and postdoc and astronomy enthusiast and all of our other uh, listeners? Well, I think the, the one thing I would say is that finding a life in which you feel fulfilled, uh, in which you uh, feel like you've made a difference uh, is not easy. Uh, I think most of us feel challenged to um, have made some contribution to our science, even to our lives, our, our communities, uh, even our personal lives. And I think that the best thing I can offer in this is everybody should, in my view, should feel comfortable with who they are, whatever contribution they make, uh, find peace of mind, uh, with your artistry, with your science, with your contributions. Uh, try not to put a heavy burden on yourself and feel like uh, you're, you're bearing this responsibility to, to hit a home run. Uh, it's better if you feel comfortable with yourself, with, who, with exactly who you are, and enjoy the ride, because the, the journey is frankly a short one. Um, but, you know, we're all here making a difference for humanity, which hopefully will help the next generation. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure.